Today I am here with Cooper Carraway, uh, president of the local Sioux Falls AFL-CIO. Uh, just wanted to talk to you a little bit about maybe some current events and just talking to you about organizing, labor unions, kind of things like that sure. in general. So yeah. um, kind of the first thing that I wanted to touch on um, to start off was uh, uh, you, I know you've told me before that you started getting organizing or into organizing at an early age. Um, what was that like um, as far as, you know, what were you organizing around or just, you know, maybe kind of touch on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, honestly, uh, organizing is something that came natural um, to me. Um, it seemed like a natural way to solve uh, an issue or a problem. Sure. Um, my uh, you know my grandfather was a steel worker um, you know my family's from the south um, and so yeah so organizing came really naturally you know I think the first organizing campaign I had was maybe um, maybe fourth grade um, I, I didn't um, I didn't feel like I liked the way a school project was going um, okay. I felt like that um, adult chaperones had too much say and oh, that's cool. <laughs> and we're you know taking the agency away from uh, from me and from my group of, of classmates. Sure. Um, so I uh, decided to organize against that and failed miserably. Um, but it was a learning <laughs> experience. Um, you know, from there, you know, it, it just it just seemed like the most obvious uh, way to handle any issue. Um, the um, you know, first serious campaign uh, I was involved in was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, this was during the Bush administration. And um, the Bush administration was really fond of using uh, immigration and customs enforcement to uh, raid um, plants and factories um, in, the, in the U.S. Um, and uh, so um, I was living in a small town, Mount Pleasant, Texas. And uh, uh, I said, come in and set up camp and, you know, was um, uh, taking people's parents away, um, you know, while they were at school uh, with little to no explanation. Folks would come home to an empty house. Um, so uh, we started organizing um, just to, you know, the basic uh, uh, call to action was, you know, just get out of, get out of our town, you know, go somewhere else. Um, stop taking our family members away. Um, so we organized there, um, and a day after our planned action, uh, uh, the ICE agents left town. Uh, if they'd been there two weeks, they might have been <laughs> planning to do that anyway, but uh, we, um, we claimed a victory, though. Sure, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, uh, but um, later on, um, you know, from there, that, that just led to uh, getting involved in the labor movement, uh, which is... Um, is you know the only the only thing that working class people have that's accessible and that can you know lead to uh, better benefits you know better quality of life sure. um, and and more power. Yep, definitely. Um, so on Sunday when we were at the uh, the family still we belong, belong together rally um, and you were talking at that um, and there was I noticed one thing that you kind of honed in on or kept touching base on was just the fact of like international worker solidarity. So kind of that solidarity going beyond borders. Um, and that's definitely something I think as Americans, we're used to uh, being kind of told that that is not a thing. You know, we're not supposed to have solidarity across borders. We're, over, uh, we're supposed to be competitive across borders. So, you know, like a worker in Mexico or a worker in China, we're not supposed to have solidarity, you know, with that kind of worker. Um, uh, what what do you think has been a good way of just like cultivating that solidarity, you know, within the labor movement? Like, what's what's been a good way to kind of show people, you know, that hey, that worker in Mexico or that worker overseas is not your enemy. You know, they're they're working alongside you. They're also being exploited, you know, by by their bosses. Yeah. So I mean, I think a lot of it is just uh, kind of breaking through that um, uh, that kind of shield that people have um, up and you know you know the idea that um, American workers are somehow uh, not part of the international working class or separate from the international working class sure you know that that's a that's an that's an old old idea um, and it was created by uh, by the bosses mm -hmm. um, you know bef you know today 
uh, those in power will say that American workers are not part of the international working class. Yeah. 50 years ago, the bosses were telling white workers that black workers were not part of the working class. Um, you know, before that, they were saying that uh, Chinese and Chinese American workers who were building the railroads were not part of the working class, mm. and white workers shouldn't organize with them. Sure. Um, so this is this is an old tactic, um, and it's you know it's an old message uh, from those in power, and you know its only purpose is to keep working people divided and separate and competing and fighting amongst each other, mm. while the bosses are are you know cashing checks and popping champagne. Um, you know, the, you know they'll tell us that we're supposed to compete um, with workers all over the place while they're making trade deals and and being buddy buddy with with bosses and CEOs all over the world. Um, you know, the, the bosses themselves are not not uh, recognizing national borders or international borders. Uh, the bosses themselves, you know, their capital and their greed uh, and their exploitation, uh, you know, it, it flows freely across all borders. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is that the only way that we'll be able to fight that is not by saying, you know, we're American workers and we're different, everyone else is on their own. The way to uh, defeat uh, or, uh, organized international exploitation is with an organized international uh, labor. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so as the president of the Sioux Falls AFL-CIO, what have you seen as being like one of the biggest hurdles in the current labor movement, just in like Sioux Falls kind of in general? Uh, well, uh, a big issue is that South Dakota has very few, um, very few labor laws. Mm. Um, and so that's why you'll see that South Dakota is 47th uh, in the country in workplace safety. Uh, they're near the bottom in teacher pay. They're near the bottom in uh, uh, wages. Um, they're near the bottom in, in, in damn near every category except corruption. They're typically you know, <laughs> uh, near the top uh, when it comes to corruption. Um, and so it, what that translates to is that um, when you don't have uh, standard workplace safety uh, laws and regulations, people get hurt uh, and people die. Uh, South Dakotans die at work at a rate that is more than twice the national average. Um, they're not doing anything that folks in, in Montana are not doing. They're not doing anything folks in Minnesota are not doing. Um, the only difference is that there's no state regulations to protect them. Mm -hmm. um, all that they have, the, the only thing workers have in South Dakota is the labor movement. Mm -hmm. um, and for a state where, uh, you know, the, the state government, um, the majority party, uh, the state agencies mm -hmm. are all committed and lined up solidly against the working class, um, that creates a lot of hurdles and hardships that are really unnecessary and that workers in, in other states and other countries don't face and don't have to deal with. Right. Um, but um, at the end of the day, the only way, you know, at the end of the day, the only thing South Dakota workers have is each other. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where our power is. Sure. Um, and so the more we organize and the more we stick together, the more we'll be willing to change things. Yeah. There's no politician in, in Pierre or in D.C. that's coming to save us. Mm -hmm. um, we have to organize and we have to um, we have to save ourselves sure um, so kind of touching back on the issue of of ice so you, you know you're talking about how you rallied kind of against them in high school um, uh, with the current escalation of you know just hearing about ice so you know we're hearing about raids more often we're hearing especially like just the last couple of days we're hearing about concentration camps and, and things like that from ice um, how how are ways that just you know, ordinary citizens, ordinary citizens can kind of organize and uh, just kind of work together to resist kind of that the whole situation that's going on right now. Yeah. So um, one of the most effective ways, you know, you can always call your congressman mm -hmm. and ask them, you know, to to do something to close down the camps. Um, you can do that. Um, but the most effective ways that I've seen um, to take action against concentration camps on the southern border is when workers take
take action themselves. Um, for example, uh, workers at the Wayfair uh, plant um, walked out. They went on. They went on strike uh, because they found out that uh, their company had a multi-million-dollar contract uh, with a concentration camp, um, and uh, they walked out mm -hmm. and, and let the company know that the workers are not going to be party um, to these crimes. Um, and you know, I think history uh, has taught us that the most effective way uh, that regular folks. Can can make a difference and make a change is by using uh, uh, using and withholding their labor uh, in a strategic fashion. Right. Um, so you know, in my opinion, um, the the workers at that uh, Wayfair location are heroic, and I would be happy to see that type of thing emulated across the country. Yeah, awesome. Um, so for one last thing, do you have uh, any kind of words of encouragement for people who? Kind of in our current political uh, economic climate, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are starting to, or maybe have been feeling for a long time, you know, feeling like alienated, especially at, at the workplace. Um, you know, just feeling anxious about a lot of the things that are going on. Um, you know, anxious about the economy, things like that. Do you have maybe anything that you could, um, maybe like a word of advice, or even just just what people in that situation can do or start to do uh, to maybe start to see a change of some kind? Yeah, so, you know, the first thing I would say and point out is that the, when you're feeling alienated and anxious, uh, that is by design. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, you're, you're okay, you're fine, there's nothing wrong with you as a person. Um, you're not broken. Uh, the system that we live under, the economic and political system we live under, is set up to make regular working folks feel alienated. You know, it goes back to what we were saying before, uh, that the only way the folks in power now maintain their power is by dividing us. Uh, and so a result of that division is that feeling of alienation, uh, of isolation. Um, but uh, the reality is, you know, a, a force that is stronger than that feeling of anxiety and alienation um, is called solidarity. Mm -hmm. And solidarity, you can't, you can't measure it. You know, solidarity is not something you post on social media. It's not a like or a retweet or a share. Mm -hmm. uh, solidarity is, is an invisible force that binds every working person around the world together. Mm -hmm. It binds me to you and it binds us to workers in Mexico and in Canada and all over the world. Um, and that that force can't be broken. Um, you know, you can't measure it, but you can feel it. I know you can feel it, I can feel it. You know, right. we all can feel it mm -hmm. when we see it. Um, and so that force is stronger than anything uh, that is going to come against you. Those feelings of isolation, alienation, told you're not good enough, you know, you're being overworked, mm -hmm. the forces of exploitation, uh, those, are, those are strong and... and and they can make you feel terrible, but the, feel, the force of solidarity is stronger than all of those things. Um, and so what, what I would encourage people to do is look for community. Um, uh, look for a, a collective action. Um, look for opportunities for collective and direct action. Um, you know, and there are institutions set up all over the world and all over this country and all over South Dakota. There are institutions set up for working people that were built and set up by working people, regular working class people that also were feeling alienated mm. and feeling anxious. You know, this building we're sitting in, every brick was laid by a working person. Yep. Working class people came together and said, we need institutions of our own. We need organizations of our own so that we can stand up for ourselves against the forces of organized greed and capital. And that's what we have now. We have the Labor Temple. We have the AFL-CIO. And we have 35 local unions affiliated with the AFL-CIO and here, right here in Sioux Falls. Yeah. People don't think of South Dakota as a, as a union state. Mm -hmm. Here in Sioux Falls, we have 5,000 union members. Everyone in Sioux, I guarantee you, everyone in Sioux Falls knows a union member or is related to one. And, and there's only room to grow. Um, so when you're feeling isolated, alienated, um, and anxious, the cure for that is solidarity. Mm -hmm. And solidarity lives here at the Labor Temple. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Cooper. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Yeah, anytime. Absolutely.